Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. We have a great presentation for you today. Before we get started, I have just a few announcements. We do have a handout that's available for you in the handouts pod. You can click on the file and then click to download it and save it to your desktop. We also have uh, several polling questions for you today. In order to earn CPE, you will need to respond to 75% of the polls. So make sure when they come up on your screen that you enter a response and you'll receive your CPE certificate in about two weeks. If you have any questions throughout the webinar today, you can type them in the questions pod and we will get to them as time permits. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Melissa. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be able to talk to you today about this uh, standard. It's a big standard. It started out specifically in the grants area and then it has morphed into something much bigger than we thought. So today's uh, title is Clarifying the Scope and the Accounting Guidance for Contributions Received and Contributions Made. So this also applies to for-profit entities, foundations that also make these contributions. So there's uh, quite a bit in here. Uh, again, my name is Melissa Galasso. I am a director in the Audit Professional Practices Group, and I am out of the Charlotte office. And my responsibility is primarily in the technical area for the nonprofit and government groups. And obviously, this is going to be one that has a pretty big impact on our nonprofit groups. And so we're going to talk a little bit about our new ASU here. So the two things that we are going to cover uh, are the two real areas that are covered in ASU 2018-08, uh, which was just issued a couple weeks ago. It was not even a month yet uh, ago that this was issued. Um, it was 2018-08 is on clarifying the scope and accounting for contributions received and made. It addresses two big areas, contributions versus exchange transactions. When do you know if something's a contribution versus when is an exchange transaction? This is going to be very important as topic 606 for revenue recognition comes into play. And then if you are in the contribution guidance, uh, there's been a little bit of a change in the difference between a condition and a restriction that may have a material impact on your financial statement. So I wanted to really run through those items with you today. So as I said, this is going to be uh, the entire 50 minutes today is on ASU 2018-08, uh, and it was literally just issued. It is trying to address a lot of the issues in diversity and practice. Uh, so if we look at a particular grant, you might notice that one recipient treats it as an exchange transaction. Another recipient might treat it as a contribution, and that was due to an interpretation of the definition of a contribution. And so the reason this has become extraordinarily pressing is that if you are in an exchange transaction, you are required to follow topic 606, which is revenue recognition. Now, if you think about that, the revenue recognition standard not only requires that you go through that five-step process, but also requires a significant amount of new disclosures that would be required under the standard. And so FASB wanted to make sure before we start diving into this five-step process, that we really, really were an exchange transaction. And so they kind of stepped back and they took a look and tried to help us with that. Um, the other area that they wanted to really address the diversity and practice on was if we have what's ending up gonna happen today, is that a lot of things that are treated as exchange transaction are going to ultimately be treated as contributions under the standard. Uh, because of that, the timing of recognition is going to be under play. And so they really wanted to take a look at the conditional accounting that was really lacking guidance uh, prior to the issuance of the standard. Now, the timing of this standard does not um, make me thrilled. I would have loved to have seen this come out last year. And that is for those of you who are conduit bond obligors, you will notice that the timing on this is not in your favor because of the date. So if you have a 1231 year end and you are a conduit bond obligor, you are already six and a half months deep in your revenue recognition project, right? It was effective January 1. So we really want to make sure that we understand what the implication of this standard is going to be. So a very interesting one that we're going to dive into. So just to give us some heads up here, there were some changes in the definition. So it's important to think about um, when we're looking at this, the definitions in the master glossary are, are going to change. And so I'm going to start off with the concept of a conditional promise to give. 
Uh, under the old definition, we talked about a promise to give that depended on the occurrence of a specified future and uncertain event to bind the promisor. And it really focused on what we would consider today to be probability, right? That uncertainty. So a future uncertain event. And so that was really the driving factor on when something was conditional. Under the new standard, uh, they kind of back away from that probability assessment. And so the new definition is a little bit of a punt. It says a promise to give that is subject to donor imposed conditions. Uh, so hence, the need for a new definition for donor-imposed conditions. So again, if we look at the old definition of a donor-imposed condition, it goes back to a stipulation that specifies a future and uncertain event whose occurrence or failure to occur gives the promisor a right of return or releases the promisor from its obligation. And so really, again, still focused on that probability analysis. Under the new standard, we move away from that. And so now it is a donor stipulation, and that donor could include a contributor, it can include a maker of grants, right? It does not have to be a strict definition of the term donor, right? So a grantor could also have stipulations that represent a barrier that must be overcome before the recipient is entitled. So we're gonna switch from looking about, uh, talking about uncertain future events to a barrier, and we're gonna introduce some new ideas of what do we mean by the term barrier, including three indicators that are included in the standard. Now, if you do not overcome the barrier, that's going to give the contributor a right of return or a right of release. So that same concept of right of return and right of release are gonna continue, except it's not going to be an event that we're necessarily looking for. We're looking for a barrier. The last word uh, that we're gonna talk about today is the term contribution. And when we think about contribution, uh, they do keep the same overall definition, but in the guidance, it continues on after the original definition. And it used to say that in a contribution transaction, the value, if any, returned to the resource provider is incidental to the public potential public benefit. So basically saying you might get something back, but in a contribution that's really incidental. Uh, the term that they use in exchange transaction is that the public benefits are secondary to the potential proprietary benefits to the resource provider. And this has confused people because incidental sounds like it's a byproduct and so does uh, when you look at it from that way, secondary. And so it confuses people as to what they were trying to say in terms of the potential public benefit. And that has caused a lot of confusion over the years, causing some people to really think that, um, that it's going to be a, um, that it, when they go through this, that it's going to cause it to be an exchange transaction because of the public benefit. Other people did not think it was an exchange transaction, thought it was a contribution despite the public benefit. Uh, and so that was really causing a lot of frustration so under the new definition, uh, if a con in a contribution transaction, the resource provider often receives value, but what they're going to use here is indirectly by providing a societal benefit, although the benefit is not considered to be of commensurate value. So very clearly indicating here that, yeah, if you're receiving a societal benefit, that is not direct commensurate value for the resource provider. So if a grantor is going to give you a grant and it benefits the general public, that does not mean that the grantor is directly benefiting and that would still be what we consider to be incidental. Uh, in an exchange transaction, the potential public benefits are secondary to the direct potential benefits to the resource provider. So again, focusing on the fact that the resource provider receives direct benefit as a result. And so we're gonna dive into a lot of detail here. All right, so. Here is, we're gonna break it into the two sections. Um, there is going to be a section on contributions versus exchange, and then there's going to be one on the conditions versus restrictions. All right, so let's dive on in to this topic. Now, when we look at contribution versus exchange, one of the biggest issues that existed, and this was very, very regional, uh, so it depends on what part of the country you're joining us from, but, some people felt like the type of provider was an indicator of whether something was a contribution versus exchange. 
So for example, there were people who felt like the government, for example, federal government, would never give a contribution and anything that you receive from the federal government had to be an exchange transaction because governments don't give contributions. Uh, that is a, by Spadafi's definition, a faulty interpretation. Uh, and so what they clarified here is that it doesn't matter who the resource provider is. That's not a factor in determining whether it is an exchange transaction or whether it is a contribution. And so no longer, it doesn't matter if it's a government agency, it doesn't matter if it's a foundation, a corporation, or any other entity, that has no bearing on whether something is ultimately going to be a contribution versus an exchange. And that is definitely a school of thought. If you look at the comment letters that they received for this ASU, some people argue that they disagreed with that statement. But that is the ultimate statement by FASB, and that is the rule now, that you cannot consider who the resource provider is in determining whether something is a contribution versus an exchange transaction. In addition, when we look at the definition, we saw the change in the definition of contribution, they're very clear here that the resource provider, whether it's a foundation, a government agency, a corporation, is by definition not synonymous with the general public, right? So a, a benefit received by the public as a result of the transfer is not equivalent to commensurate value. Therefore, if you're only receiving indirect value that's benefiting the potential uh, public benefit, then by definition that's not commensurate value and therefore would be more indicative of a contribution. So in the past, this has caused a lot of confusion for people. So if I give a grant and it's going to improve homelessness and I'm the government that oversees these homeless people, some people would say, well, by getting rid of the homeless people, the government is going to be able to be improved because now they're going to have these awesome jobs and they're going to have these great places to live as a result of this grant. And therefore, we're erasing this homelessness. And by definition, obviously, that really helps the government. And Fazby is saying, no, that really helps the homeless. And we're hopeful that we help the homeless. That's the whole purpose of the grant. But that's not helping the government directly. It's an indirect benefit. And therefore, it would be indicative of a contribution. This gets into the concept of what we also see very frequently is, well, it's the mission of the foundation to erase and eradicate homelessness. And they gave us a grant and it's going to eradicate homelessness. So therefore, we are, you know, meeting their mission and therefore that's commensurate value. As he says, no. Execution of the resource provider's mission or positive sentiment from acting uh, in, as a donor is not going to be commensurate value received for the purposes of determining whether something is an exchange transaction or whether it's a contribution. So the same concept here that even though you are, you know, the resource provider might be a foundation, it doesn't matter if it's meeting their positive sentiments or their mission, that in and of itself would not be an indicator of an exchange transaction. So other things that we would, so those three are really cleaned up in the standard. They're relatively new in terms of the cleanup that they've done. Now, the bottom three were in existence at that time, uh, and they just sort of um, kind of cleaned them up, but not too much change from the original uh, guidance that we had prior to the issuance of the standard. And so when we look here um, at letter, uh, at expressed intent, expressed intent has to be asserted by both the recipient and the resource provider. If it's to exchange a good or service, that's going to be indicative of an exchange transaction. If it uh, solicits an asset for the purpose of, uh, of going through and receiving a contribution, then obviously that's going to be a contribution. So you have to look at what the expressed intent, so what is the, the recipient soliciting and what is the intent of the provider? So going back to that concept of what did you think that you were signing up for? Uh, I think then another one that we see very frequently is discretion, right? So if the resource provider has discretion in determining the amount of the transferred asset, that's typically going to be indicative of a contribution. However, if you have to agree on the amount, uh, that's going to be more indicative of commensurate value and therefore more likely to be an exchange transaction. So 
I'll give you an example of that. Um, every year I have a little girl. She's going to be 11 in September. We're very excited. Um, but every year my daughter and I go on a girl's trip. We've done this for a few years now. It's a lot of fun. We leave my husband at home and we pick a city and we hit it. So this year we did Washington, D.C. Uh, and last year we did New York City. And so every year we kind of try to pick a cool place to go and hang out. Uh, and we usually spend four or five days, just the two of us doing our girl stuff, uh, hitting up all the fun areas. And so when we were in New York City, my daughter had just read a book about a couple of children who had run away to the Mets. And so she really wanted to go see the Mets. So we did. So we uh, landed. And one of the first places we went after we landed in New York City was the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Well, if you've ever walked into the Met, it is a huge building. Uh, and there's a right on Central Park, so there's a few ways to access it. But if you go into the main entrance, you're going to see three big halls. You're going to see one to the left, one directly in front of you, and one to the right. And they all have different timing, uh, et cetera. So right to the right of us was the um, Egyptian, which my daughter really wanted to see. Uh, so as we walked towards the hall that had the Egyptian art in there, uh, you do have to hit a booth, a ticket booth. And when you get to the ticket booth, it's a really interesting experience. They didn't say, oh, two people and then give me an amount. They said, how much would you like to give? And I kind of looked at them funny. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, we don't tell you how much to give. You have the opportunity to determine. They said, here are some suggestions. Uh, but if you wanted to give us $5, we would take it. If you wanted to give us $50, we would take it. If you wanted to give us $5,000, we would take it for entry into the museum. So I, I was a little surprised by that and so I was able to select for my daughter and I how much we wanted to pay to enter the museum. So kind of looked at their suggestions and kind of went along with it but again it was up to me to determine the amount. So clearly that would be a pretty good indicator of a contribution. I decided what I wanted to pay. Uh, they didn't have any real say in that process. Now the Metropolitan is a beautiful amazing uh, uh, museum. We had a great time there. We spent a long time. We almost closed the place down. Uh, but on our way out, uh, they're very smart. They have a very large museum shop. Uh, and as we were walking through the museum shop, uh, the prices on some of those items were clearly a little bit above what I would have thought they would be. However, uh, my daughter really wanted a few of them. And so we decided to make a few purchases from the museum gift shop. In that scenario, that's more indicative of an exchange transaction in the fact that they clearly labeled how much they wanted and I had to agree that the amount that they indicated was an acceptable price for the goods and services. And so when you're looking at it from that perspective, they can have both contribution revenue and exchange revenue from the same donor slash customer. So going back to discretion. And then the last one that they really looked at here was penalties. So uh, if the penalty is being assessed on the recipient for failure to comply with the terms and conditions are just limited to the delivery of the assets that have already been provided in return of the unspent amount, that's generally going to be a condition or a, sorry, a contribution. And the reason that is, is that there's really no punishment. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. So you have to give us back the money, but they didn't penalize you really. You just had to give back the money you didn't deserve. On the other hand, if you have some type of provision of economic forfeiture beyond what was provided to you, that's typically going to be an exchange transaction. So if you don't do something on time and you have to pay a penalty, that clearly is going to be above and beyond. Uh, and so that would be an indicator of commensurate value and therefore an exchange transaction. And so they have these indicators uh, that they really walk through as they go through this. Now, they also clearly indicate what is not in the scope of the standard. So remember, there's two things in the standard, contributions made and contributions received. And so what they clarify here uh, as they're going through this is that the um, contribution guidance is going to be applicable to certain types of transactions. Now, one of the things you might remember is that in uh, topic 958, uh, so it's 958.605, and then in the implementation guide, which is 55.8, there used to be these really awesome indicators of what was an exchange transaction versus a contribution. That is being superseded by the standard. So please, uh, if you're used to going back and using that, the a a guide needs to be updated as obviously the, con the codification has already been updated. And that those indicators are superseded. So the ones that I went over are the only ones that you would really consider at this point in time.
All right, so let's talk now here about scope. So when we look at the contributions guidance, it specifically does not apply to exchange transactions, right? So exchange transactions are subject to the exchange guidance, whether it be topic 606 or topic 610, depending on what it is that you're buying or selling, uh, it is not subject to a contribution. In addition, there's special guidance, what we call agency transactions, when you're acting as an agent, a trustee, or an intermediary. In those scenarios, those are not subject to this guidance. So if you think about uh, sort of the, if you give a donation to an entity and then indicate who the ultimate beneficiary of that donation should be, the, uh, in the person who receives that is going to recognize a liability. And then when they pass that money through to the ultimate beneficiary, they are going to release the liability and uh, credit cash in that scenario. And so that is an agency transaction. And those are outside the scope here as well. Tax exemptions, tax incentives, and tax abatements, those are not within this standard. Now, if you are on the GASB side as well, you would note that GASB has a disclosure requirement for tax abatements now. And uh, that's something that has gotten a lot of attention recently. Uh, but on the other side of it, uh, the fourth bullet here, transfers for governments to business entities. So the government is giving the indicator of what they've given out. Uh, there is now a disclosure project on the FASB side to um, look at the transfers from a government to a business entity and have the business entity report what they are receiving. So that is going to be an interesting one. And then the last one is something that's very important. I know that we have from the looking at the uh, in, uh, list of people who signed up for this, we have a lot of universities on the line. And what we want to be careful about is what we call third-party payer transactions. So if you are uh, transferring assets as part of an existing exchange transaction, then that is not going to be subject to this accounting. And so I'll give you an example of the third-party payer using the, um, the university setting. If I am a student and I sign up to go to school, I enter into a transaction with the university to receive an education, right? So I'm going to be charged tuition. So I have an exchange transaction with the university. Now, if I happen to receive a federal grant as part of that, and the grant is paid directly to the university, that doesn't make it additional revenue, right? That's just basically a third party paying for my exchange transaction. It's no different than if my dad had cut the check, or my husband had cut the check, or I cut the check, right? It's just someone else is cutting the check in the relationship between the university and the student. And so in that scenario, that does not create a contribution, right? That is not part of that standard. What it's really focusing on here is that it's just some third party making a payment uh, on behalf of an existing exchange transaction. All right, so when we think about this, uh, we want to make sure that we can apply this. And so one of the things that they do talk about here is they talk about a lot of the language. And so we're going to go through and look at some examples uh, as we go through this. Now, I want to call attention to a couple of things. It doesn't matter if you use the term gift, grant, or donation. Contribution revenue applies whether or not, right? So you don't have to actually call it revenue in your financial statements, you don't have to call it contribution revenue in your financial statements, right? So you can still call it grant revenue, that's fine, as long as you're treating it appropriately. So the term used in the financial statement presentation to label it is not a factor when you're trying to determine the scope, right? So that has no impact here. And so when we're looking at this, the guidance in this standard applies to whether you are making a contribution or whether you are receiving it. So it applies to the resource provider, and the resource recipient at the end of the day. So what we're going to do today is we're gonna walk through a couple of examples. This is your time to shine, and these are where your polling questions are going to come from. So let's take a look here at Not-for-Profit A. Not-for-Profit A is a large, resource, a large research university that has a cancer research center. Not-for-Profit A regularly conducts the research to uh, discover more effective methods of treating cancer and often receives contributions to support its efforts. Not-for-profit A receives resources from a pharmaceutical entity to finance the cost of a clinical trial of an experimental cancer drug the pharmaceutical entity had developed. The pharmaceutical entity specifies the protocol of the testing, including the number of participants to be tested, the dosages to be administered, and the frequency and nature of the follow-up uh, examinations. 
In addition, the pharmaceutical entity requires a detailed report of the test outcome within two months of the test conclusion, and the rights to the results of the study belong to the pharmaceutical entity. So here is your first polling question. Do you believe that this is going to be an exchange transaction, or do you believe this is a contribution? All right, so one of those fun items is to see that impact here. All right. So again, you should see a poll that has popped up for you, and you're gonna pick whether it is an exchange transaction or whether it is a contribution, All right? So you're just going to click on the poll. All right. Again, if you would like to uh, deal with the CPE here, we do encourage you to um, make sure that you are answering the polling question as it is being um, performed here. All right, so I'm going to close out this poll here and let's go over the answers. Okay, so in this scenario, uh, as you have uh, mostly come to the conclusion of, so there is a 92% of you voted, uh, and 81% of the people who voted told us it's an exchange transaction, and that is correct. Because the results of the clinical trial have commercial value to the pharmaceutical entity, they are gonna receive commensurate value as the resource provider. Therefore, this is not contribution revenue for not-for-profit entity A, and it's not a disbursement of the resources a contribution is going to be made. So they're not going to, the pharmaceutical entity can't treat this as a uh, contribution made. It can't treat it as a uh, disbursement for a contribution. And the uh, obviously the not-for-profit is not going to, um, when they're looking at the uh, treatment of this, it would not be a, um, it would be exchange revenue as we go through. All right, let's look at a second example here. This is student L. So student L is enrolled at University A. Uh, she is, has tuition for $30,000 for the semester. It's a very expensive school. Uh, and student L received a grant in the amount of $2,000 to use by, uh, towards the tuition fee, which is paid directly by the grantor to University A. So again, we're gonna pop open a poll here for you. And the question is, is this going to be an exchange transaction or is this going to be a contribution? So when we're looking at this, is this going to be a contribution or is this going to be an exchange transaction? And so all you have to do is click on the little uh, buttons there in order for that poll to be acknowledged, right? So for those of you who are looking for CPE, we encourage this. So student L received a grant in the amount of $2,000 to use towards tuition. And obviously we have University A here and they want to know, is that going to be uh, contribution revenue or is that going to be related to the exchange transaction? All right, so we are at a TED split. So let's close that poll. Uh, you are literally at a 50-50 split. It's now 49-51. Uh, but in this scenario, remember, the grant was awarded to the student, not to the university, right? And University A entered into an exchange transaction with student L for $30,000. Therefore, the $2,000 grant does not create any additional revenue, but just serves as a partial payment against the $30,000 because there's already an identified customer of the University A. And so therefore, that is part of the exchange transaction, right? It's payment towards the $30,000. It is not going to be contribution revenue because that $2,000, despite the fact that it's a grant, right, the university already has an existing exchange transaction. Student L is getting the benefit of an education and the university is providing that education as part of an exchange transaction. So that does not qualify for contribution accounting. All right, let's take a look at another one. So here we have the local government uh, is providing funding to not-for-profit C to perform a research study on the benefits of a longer school year. And I am so up for that. Uh, keeping my daughter busy all summer is quite a task for me, so I would be totally in on this one. Uh, the agreement requires not-for-profit C to plan the study, perform the research, and summarize and submit the research to the local government. The local government retains all rights to the study. So again, we're gonna ask you to vote here. 
is this going to be an exchange transaction or is this going to be a contribution? And remember, it applies to both the resource provider and the resource recipient. So the same guidance applies no matter who is performing. All right, so we're gonna open up that poll and let you guys vote here. Again, is it an exchange transaction or is it a contribution? Remember, do you click on those results? They help us to understand where we are in this process. All right. All right, we are still voting, so please get those last votes in. We're at 91% of you have already voted, and so we encourage that voting to help us understand what you're thinking. All right, so with that, let's close this poll. And what we're gonna talk about here is that obviously in this scenario, most of you got this right, not the profit C really has a procurement arrangement, right? There's two parties here. And in exchange, right, this is an exchange transaction. Not-for-profit C is performing the study for the local government. However, the local government retains the rights to the study. So in that scenario, they're going to receive commensurate value, and therefore this would be subject to a uh, contra it would be subject to the exchange transaction uh, guidance. And so it would be subject to topic 606, including all of the identification of the customer, identification of the contract, going through and looking for performance obligations, calculating the transaction price, allocating the transaction price, recognizing revenue, and all of those related disclosures now would be going through and doing that because the local government is retaining all the rights to this. So this is going to go back, uh, and as we look at this, we're going to have not-for-profit C as we go through. All right. So let's look at example four here. Uh, this one is a um, university as well. The university applied for and was awarded a grant from the federal government. Uh, the university D must follow the rules and regulations established by OMB of the federal government and the federal awarding agency, right? So this is very common. This is just a um, uniform guidance, single audit type of world. Uniform D is required, or University D is required to incur qualifying expenses to be entitled to the asset. Any unspent money during the grant period is forfeited, and University D is required to return any advanced funding that does not have related qualifying expenses. All right. Uh, University D is also required to submit a summary of research findings to the federal government, but University D retains the right to the findings and has permission to publish the findings if it desires. All right. So now, what do you think? Is this going to be an exchange transaction or is this going to be a contribution? So again, in that poll, you get to uh, choose between an exchange transaction or a contribution. Well, you guys are quick on this one. 72% of you have already voted. As <laughs> Clearly, you like the ones that have a little bit more meat to them. All right. Beautiful. Please make sure you are clicking on the poll. It helps us to understand where you are and also helps you to get CCE. All right, so overall, it looks like we can now close that poll and talk a little bit about it. And 73% of you did get this one right as well. So in this scenario, University D has indicated that this grant is not a transaction where there's a, a, a commensurate value. The federal government as the resource provider doesn't receive commensurate value in exchange for the assets they're providing, right? University D retains all the rights to the research findings and the findings, and they are then able to publish them if they desire. Therefore, the public is probably going to be a beneficiary here, but the because it's uh, the federal government is receiving an indirect benefit, and the findings serve the general public, that is not going to lead us to exchange transaction, that's gonna lead us to contribution accounting. So why is this so important? Why is this going to um, be an a, important indicator? Well, just think about how this works. If it's an exchange transaction, it's subject to topic 606, so you have to go through and you have to uh, satisfy a performance obligation in order to recognize revenue. Contribution accounting, right, you can recognize a promise when it's made without having to even wait for the receipt of the cash, right? So just a promise to give that meets the definition of a contribution, right? You would recognize that pledge 
uh, and the re related revenue. So contributions are recognized as revenues in the period that they receive, uh, and therefore you would have to look at the impact. Now there could be, um, when you think about that, timing differences based on whether you treat something as an exchange transaction or you treat it as a contribution. But even more importantly, when you think about the impact, it's going to also have an impact on ultimately how you have the disclosures, right? If it's, if it's going to be contribution revenue, the disclosures are very different than if it seems to be exchange revenue. And that's really what we want you to be focused on uh, as we go through this. So as a result, the FASD believes that many grants today, many contributions, many contracts, whatever language you want to use, are ultimately going to end up falling into the contribution guidance because of some of the clarifications related to the mission, related to third-party payers, uh, related to some of the guidance related to um, the who is receiving commensurate value. They feel like there's just going to be more grants that will end up being condition or being contributions. And so once you have more stuff flowing into contribution accounting, they wanted to make sure that contribution accounting uh, was a little bit more clear because there was diversity in practice here as well. And so people, because of the probability analysis, because of that future uncertain event, were trying to determine whether the probability was remote. Because if it was remote, it really wasn't a condition. And that created a lot of things not running through conditional guidance. And so the FASB wanted to address that. And so they changed the definition of a condition. So in when we talked about it earlier, we talked about a donor-imposed condition has to have both a barrier that must be overcome before the recipient is entitled to the assets transferred to promise and a right of return or a release of the right to transfer, or a right of release to transfer. So when you think about this, the uh, now we talk about the concept of having a barrier, not a future uncertain event. And we're going to define a barrier in a couple of minutes. Um, but it still retains the right of return and right of release concept, but it moves away from probability assessment. You can no longer consider probability as part of this. So they've uh, created three types of indicators of barriers. The original exposure draft actually had four, and they ultimately decided to go uh, with three of the four. Now, based on reading the agreement, it has to be clear that there is a barrier and there has to be a right of return, right? So you don't have to have the phrase right of return. You don't have to have the phrase release from obligation. You don't have to have the term barrier. But when you read the agreement, it should be sufficiently clear to support your conclusion, all right? So you want to make sure that you're not looking for particular words, but you're really just looking into this. And so you're going to have to evaluate each agreement uh, to determine whether there is a barrier that has to be overcome. And so a barrier typically places specific requirements on an organization about how you're going to use their transferred assets. There is no probability assessment, right? That is not a factor when you're determining whether an agreement has a barrier. So that's going to be very hard for a lot of people because they're so used to saying, oh, well, the, you know, the risk of that is remote. There is no probability assessment. And we're going to see that several times today as we look at additional examples. So indicator number one is a measurable performance-related barrier. And so examples of a measurable performance-related barrier would include any requirement that indicates that the entitlement uh, to transfer assets is contingent upon either a specific level of service, a number of units of output, or a specific outcome. So when we're looking at these measurable performance related barriers, if there is a number that you have to achieve in order to be able to use the money, if it's a dollar, if it's a number of people who have to be served, those are all going to be indicators that you have a conditional contribution. Uh, other ones would be an other measurable barrier would be if you're entitled to the resource, if an identified event occurs, sort of like a matching requirement. And so if you think about it, if you're looking at it and trying to figure out what do you mean by a specific level of service, so I'm going to give you an example, um, 1,000 meals per week for a soup kitchen, right? Even if you're currently serving 10,000 meals a week, it doesn't matter. That is a conditional contribution because it has a number, 1,000 meals, right? A specific level of service that you now have to provide, that is going to create a condition on that grant. Uh, it also could be related to an output. So for example, achieving minimum standardized test scores or a dropout rate decline following some type of educational effort. 
or having a decline in symptoms of malnutrition following an effort to provide meals, right? So any time where they're going to be focused in on um, really on some outcome that's measurable as we go through this specific measurement, right? So if you have to get to a minimum standardized test score, that would be an indicator that you have a conditional contribution. Another one would be what we call limited discretion. This is gonna be, for a lot of people, kind of a shocker. But any time that you had, and it's, they kind of cleared this up, it was originally just limited discretion in the exposure draft, but they added to it on the conduct of the activity. And so anytime there is a requirement to follow spec, uh, spec, uh, specific, I have such trouble with that word, um, I'm pleased to specify, specific guidelines about incurring qualifying expenses, right? So if we're talking about you have to use it for qualifying expenses, that's going to be conditional. So if you're thinking about single audit, subpart E, and you're thinking about those allowable costs, yes, indeed, that is going to make your grant conditional under this standard because you have to follow, incur, you have to incur qualifying expenses. A requirement to hire specific individuals as part of some type of workforce um, that you're looking at. Following a specified protocol that must be adhered to. Right, so anything that is limiting your discretion. This is more specific than a restriction because a restriction limits the use of the contribution to a particular activity or a particular point in time, right? I want you to use this to um, you know, help teachers get continuing education, right? That's not limiting the conduct, it's limiting the activity that you can spend it on, right? So that's a restriction. When you're saying you have to spend it on these particular qualifying expenses, that's when it becomes a condition. Uh, so if there's qualifying expenses regarding rules and regulations, that's going to typically cause you to have a conditional contribution. And remember, when you have compliance with those uh, cost principles by OMB is a great example. Uh, these are typically paid on a cost reimbursement basis that requires you to incur qualifying expenses in order to be entitled and typically, if you purchase something that you are not entitled to, you have to give it back, right? So there is that uh, concept of the return, and there's typically very close reporting and monitoring by the resource provider in that area. Uh, in the indicator number three is that the stipulations are related to the purpose of the agreement. So because we've gotten rid of the concept of remote, we wanted to look at things that are gonna be administrative or trivial. So if a stipulation that the donor makes is not related to the purpose of the grant, then that's not indicative of a barrier. So this would address those administrative and, tri uh, and uh, trivial type of stipulations. So for example, providing an annual report or providing a report that summarizes performance. Those are gonna be deemed to be administrative. They're not related to the purpose of the agreement and therefore would not be an indicator of a barrier. Now, what everyone needs to be aware of here is in the case of something being an ambiguous donor stipulation where the donor has not been very clear, then if it's clearly not unconditional, it's going to be presumed to be conditional. So the presumption is basically conditional unless it's clearly unconditional. So we wanna uh, try to avoid those um, ambiguous donor stipulations. So that's going to have a pretty big aspect here. Now, FASB does indicate that it is possible that you don't have any barriers, right? So you can have just a right of release, but no barrier. In that scenario, because you have to have both, they would be treated as unconditional and you would just recognize the revenue immediately. However, if you have the barrier, you have to overcome the barrier in order to recognize revenue. So let's take a look here at another example. Foundation A gives not-for-profit B a grant in the amount of $400,000 to provide specific career training to disabled veterans. The grant requires not-for-profit D to provide training to at least 8,000 disabled veterans during the next fiscal year, a minimum of 2,000 during each quarter uh, that must be met. The foundation specifies that there is a right of release from the obligation uh, in the agreement if it, um, and will only give not-for-profit D $100,000 each quarter if they have demonstrated that those services have been provided to at least 2,000 dis disabled veterans. So in this scenario, let's go back in and let's look at a poll here. 
is this going to be conditional? And your choices are yes or no. So let's open up that new poll here. And your choices are yes or no. Is this going to be a conditional uh, grant? Right, so it's a grant in the amount of 400,000. You have to serve at least 8,000 veterans, 2,000 per quarter, and you get 100,000 per quarter, assuming that you've provided the uh, services to at least 2,000 disabled veterans. So in this scenario, would this be a conditional grant? Yes or no? All right, well, you guys did really well on this. Let's close that. The answer is yes, this is clearly conditional, right? So in this scenario, uh, the agreement contains a right of release because they would only provide and transfer the assets if they provide training to at least 8,000. And again, they focus on it being 2,000 per quarter. Therefore, they have a specific level of service that they must have. That's a measurable performance-related barrier. Because they have both, it is going to require it. It doesn't matter that they might serve 10,000 disabled veterans every quarter. That never comes into play because we do not do a probability assessment when we're looking at conditional. All right, let's look at another one. So not-for-profit B is a hospital and it has a research program. Not-for-profit B receives a $300,000 grant from the federal awarding agency to fund thyroid cancer research. The terms of the grant specify that they must incur certain qualifying expenses in compliance with the rules and regulations established by OMB and the federal awarding agency. It is paid on a reimbursement basis by initiating drawdowns of grant assets. Any unused assets are forfeited and any unallowed costs that have been drawn down are required to be refunded. So go back and let's open up another poll here. And the question is, is this a conditional grant? Yes or no? So again, just pick one of the two, kind of a binary choice here, yes or no. Is this grant going to be deemed to be conditional under the new standard? We do need you to answer. If you do want CPE, you must answer 75% of the polling questions in order to get them. Now, they don't have to be answered correctly. They just have to be answered to get CPE. All right, it looks like you guys have voted, so let's close this out. Uh, and it's a little tighter than I'd like to see. Uh, the answer is yes. So 59% of you got that right. It is conditional, right? Because there is a specific minimum requirement here, so they have to incur those qualifying expenses in accordance with OMB rules and regulations, and there's a release uh, of the obligation for unused assets, and because you have these qualifying expenses in order to be entitled, and you have that right of return in that scenario, it is going to be a conditional contribution. Therefore, if you look at this, because of that, they're not going to be able to recognize revenue until they have, um, they have overcome the, uh, the condition. So it's a pretty big change here. Because of that, their discretion has been limited to a specific item on the basis of these requirements. And this is not a going to be a restriction. So some people might have felt that's more like a restriction. But a restriction tells you uh, a purpose or it tells you a time period. We're not focusing in on that. All right, so let's take a look at another one. Let's look at not for our example number three here, which is not for profit entity uh, E here is a public charity, right? And they perform research on various uh, on various diseases and allergies, including gluten related allergies, as part of its overall mission. It receives a $100,000 grant from a foundation to perform research on gluten-related allergies over the next year. The grant agreement includes a right of return as part of the foundation's standard wording and a requirement that at the end of the grant period, a report must be filed with the foundation that explains how the assets were spent. All right, so in this scenario, you are giving your choice again of yes or no. Is this going to be conditional? All right, so um, there researching a gluten allergy. They receive $100,000 to perform research related to these gluten-free. There is a right of return and there is a required report, uh, but is this going to qualify as a condition yes or no? And make sure you are answering in those 
polling questions there. Looks like a lot of you have already voted. So let's get the last couple of you in here. All right, let's close that poll. And uh, you did, for the most part, get this right. 63% of you got this right. The answer is no, right? There's no condition here. The purpose of the research on gluten allergies results in a donor restricted revenue because the purpose of the grant is narrower than the overall mission of the entity. However, there's no requirements that indicate a barrier, right? So we don't meet any of the requirements for a barrier because that report would be deemed to be administrative in nature and not related to the purpose, which is the actual research. So this is an example of a right of return, but it does not have a related barrier and therefore it would be deemed to be unconditional. All right, so let's look at another one here. So this is Foundation B. Foundation B receives a grant proposal from an annual animal rescue facility, not-for-profit F, which requests a two-year grant in the amount of $500,000 upfront to be used to expand its operations. The agreement indicates that the not-for-profit must expand its facility by at least 5,000 square feet to accommodate the additional animals by the end of the two years. The grant contains a right of return if the minimum expansion target is not achieved. So let's go back to our poll, and again, yes or no, is this one going to be conditional? So we're gonna open up another poll for you, and you're going to vote yes or no. Is there a condition here? Is there a barrier and a right of return? In order to be a condition, you have to have both a barrier and a right of return. So yes or no. Is this grant uh, from Foundation uh, for Foundation B from Not for Profit F here? Is this going to be conditional? All right, let's close that poll. And yes, in this scenario, it is conditional, right? It includes a measurable barrier, 5,000 square feet that must be achieved in order to be entitled to the asset and a right of return for unused assets or unmet requirements. So it has both in there, so it is going to be conditional. All right, let's look at the fifth one here. Uh, Not-for-profit G is a university that is conducting a capital campaign to build a new building to house its School of Mathematics and to make capital improvements to existing buildings on campus including a new heating system and an upgraded telephone and computer network. Not-for-profit G receives an upfront grant in the amount of $10,000 from a foundation as part of its capital contribution campaign. Uh, the con agreement contains a right of return requiring that the assets be reimbursed to the resource provider if the assets are not used for the purpose outlined in the campaign solicitation materials. The resource provider does not include any specifications in the agreement about how the building should be constructed or on how other improvements should be made. So in this scenario, going back to our poll here, our last polling question of the day, what do you guys think? Is this one going to be conditional? And again, you have your choices here. Um, is this going to be yes or no? Is this conditional, right? So remember, you can't recognize the condition until the condition has been met. And so that would delay recognition of any funds that are received versus if it is a contribution that is unconditional, you can recognize that. So timing is really the importance here. All right, let's close that poll. And you guys did well. Not-for-profit G is going to determine that this is not conditional because it only limits the activity that is being funded, right? So it's based on the request here. It does not include specifications about how the building should be constructed, and it says it just has to use it for the purpose that's been indicated. So therefore, this is a donor-restricted revenue source because it's for the capital purpose, um, but it is not going to be conditional. So you guys did great uh, on these examples. So the reason why we spent so much time on this is obviously it has an impact on recognition and measurement. If a transfer of assets is received and it's conditional, it's actually treated as a liability until the conditions have been met or explicitly waived by the donor, meaning that you don't get to recognize revenue in that scenario. Uh, in addition, if you have a donor-imposed condition, you have to met, wait until it becomes unconditional, meaning that you've met that condition. 
So that can cause a lot of issues for people. Uh, in addition, they have these simultaneous release policies that's been changing. So under the new standard, there is a new, because today we talk about uh, donor restricted, uh, when we talk about the donor restricted assets for the simultaneous release, well now a not-for-profit can elect a simultaneous release policy for donor restricted contributions that were initially conditional, and now that the condition has been met, without having to elect it for other donor restricted contributions or investment gains or income, providing that you disclose the policy and you apply it consistently. So now there's a little bit of a change in our simultaneous release policy that you can have it just for those that were initially going to be deemed to be conditional without having to do it for your other donor restricted contributions. So a little bit of change in the simultaneous release rule. Very important is the effective date here. Um, there is two sets of effective dates, one for the resource recipient and then one for the resource provider. So this one is if you are a recipient, if you are a public business entity or a not-for-profit that has issued or is a conduit bond obligor, then it's actually going to be effective pretty much now, annual periods meaning after June 15 of 18, so your current fiscal year. For everyone else, it's going to be for fiscal periods beginning after December 15 of 18, which would be your calendar 19 and your fiscal 20. Now, it's very important that if you are a conduit bond obligor, you consider that effective date very, very carefully. What could happen if you elect to use that effective date and do not early adopt is that you might determine today, without looking at the standard, that something is an exchange transaction and you go through the process of adopting topic 606 all the related disclosures. Then you look at this standard and you adopt this standard and it goes from being an exchange transaction to being a contribution. And now all of those disclosures have to go away and you might actually have a totally different treatment for that uh, grant. So you wanna be very careful about your adoption. Early adoption is permitted. Uh, so if you are in a conduit bond setting, I would encourage you to talk to your auditor. For the resource providers, whether that be a not-for-profit entity or a commercial entity, it is going to be, if they are a conduit bond obligor or public business entities, for the calendar 19 fiscal 20. Uh, and for everyone else, it would be calendar 20 fiscal 2021. Uh, so that is uh, very important in terms of transition. Again, early application is permitted. It is on a modified retrospective basis, however, if you really want to, you can do it on a full retrospective basis. So um, it is up to you on how you would like to adopt that. All right, with that, uh, I have gone through all of the slides. I'm gonna see here, we have a couple of minutes left. If there are any questions from the group, I always like to leave a little bit of time for you guys to ask any questions that you might have as we go to wrap up today. Uh, can you get a copy of the recording? Absolutely. All of our webinars that are done uh, for our external friends are posted to our website, usually in about two weeks, and you can go back up to, I think, two years. So you can just go to www.cbh.com, and then you're going to see a section on webinars, and you will be able to watch any webinar that we have done, even if you've ever missed one. You cannot get CPE credit for a mixed, uh, missed webinar, but you can get the content, which is very important. Uh, please explain simultaneous release again. So there is a rule that basically says today that if you are going to have a restricted amount and it's going to be released in the same period, you can just treat it as unrestricted from the very beginning. So if it came in restricted, but then in the same year before you created your funding statements, it became unrestricted because you met the restriction, then that's called simultaneous release. In this scenario, you have a choice on how you want to apply it. You can apply it just to the all of your restrictions if you wanted to but you can also choose to do it for your restrictions that started out as conditional only and that is a policy election and if you make that policy election you do have to disclose that policy election all right so here's another question so if a donor gives a thousand dollars to university and stipulates that 20 is for faculty stipends 20 is for student travel and 60 is other high impact student experience uh, for fine art, is that conditional? Well, it depends. In this scenario, is there specific qualified expenses? It doesn't look like it. It looks like it's more telling you what the purpose is. So until it gets down to that, you know, there's some regulation that you have to follow. Again, the, the line there is not, a, if it's a purpose restriction, that's different than if it's going to be focused on a qualifying expense and literally getting down to the type of expense 
that you're permitted to have due to some type of regulation. So you have to be very careful on the language that's being used between restriction and condition. And that was the intent of this standard was actually to address the concept uh, in more detail. All right, in the case of a special event, if no other condition other than outlined sponsorship benefits exist, do we need to wait to recognize the relevant event? Well, that's already going to be qualifying. So if it's a special event, um, and typically those are gonna have an exchange transaction and a non-exchange transaction. So uh, the portion that's above and beyond the cost, those are going to be, um, those are going to always have a little bit of delay between the amount that's a contribution and then the amount that's the exchange. You'd have to wait for the exchange to happen. All right, example number five. I have to go and look at that one, so I will have to email you because I can't uh, flip back and see the uh, slides there. So Jennifer, I will email you that. Uh, there are no questions, but resource provider versus recipient. Is those, yeah, so a resource provider is the, is the grantor, the resource recipient is the grantee. It's the person receiving versus the person paying. All right, well, it is two o'clock on the dot. So thank you for putting in all those awesome questions at the end there. I always like to leave a little bit of time for you guys to get your questions in. As always, you have my contact information. Feel free to reach out at any time. I'm always happy to answer questions. I hope to see you on a future webinar. Thank you guys and have a great day. Bye-bye.